in terms of fueling uh, as runners, um, it's traditionally been, especially when it comes to the marathon and, and distance training, about fueling with sugars and fueling with these high glycemic, fast acting carbohydrates. So things like cereal, bagels, bananas, um, you know, your energy gels, your, your, your energy blocks, uh, sugar based energy bars. Th these are very, very common foods that you'll see at races and, and very common things that runners have traditionally consumed both before and, and during um, an endurance event or endurance training. And one of the, the issues with this fueling pattern is really the impact on your blood sugar levels. So anytime we consume a carbohydrate specifically, uh, it's going to impact our blood sugar levels in a different way. And, and when we talk about blood sugar, um, we can in a way view it to be synonymous to energy. When our blood sugar levels are very steady, our energy levels are very steady. We feel that evenness, um, you know, you, you can exercise and, and you don't feel those highs and lows, those, those ups and downs. And, and importantly, you feel like you can keep going. Now, a lot of these sugar-based or, or high glycemic carbohydrates, um, they cause the calories to enter our system very quickly. So, you know, for anybody that's consumed an energy gel and, and you know, you, you feel it as soon as you, you take it in, you feel that rush right away and you feel that sugar spike. But, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes later, when your blood sugar starts to drop, that's when you start to feel fatigue. That's when your body starts to produce certain stress hormones. Uh, when we talk about fatigue, you know, it's not just muscular fatigue, but even, even that brain fatigue. Greg talked about keeping your brain happy uh, when our glucose levels fluctuate. Uh, we get that brain fog or that that hazy feeling. So it's not certainly not ideal for performance and, and not ideal in terms of the way it makes us feel. And and then, uh, you know, one more thing when, when our blood sugar is fluctuating, whether it's during exercise or even throughout the day, we start to feel hungry. So a lot of us can relate to that, you know, that feeling of hunger an hour into a workout or, or even that, that three o'clock feeling of hunger at work uh, when your blood sugar is low. It's not necessarily that your stomach's growling, but your blood sugar being lower, your blood sugar dropping can can cause you to reach for something sugary or, or, or just feel that sensation of hunger um, where you feel like you need to consume something right away. Um, and then another thing that occurs when we spike our sugars is we negatively impact our body's ability to break down and burn fat. And in distance running, you know, Greg's talked about this at, at length, um, really uh, it's about teaching your body to become more efficient at burning fat by keeping your blood sugar steady, which is going to allow you to feel stronger in the end of the race. So when Greg's talking about a lot of athletes fading towards the end of the race, all of these things are very tied into each other. You know, if, if you can't take in enough fuel because it's upsetting your stomach late in the race, then you could be more prone to bonking. If you're constantly fueling with sugars throughout your run and, and you're teaching your body to be very carbohydrate dependent and not very efficient at burning fat, then you need to take in more fuel throughout your exercise, throughout your race or your training. And, you know, that, that for a lot of folks can lead to these GI issues where they simply can't take in the fuel. So from a performance standpoint and, and from a fitness standpoint, if we can keep our blood sugar levels very even, we're going to get the best results, both in terms of how we feel, uh, how we perform and the fitness and body composition um, that we're able to achieve throughout the training period. Now, with a lot of your traditional sports nutrition fuels, uh, the, the carbohydrate that a lot of the newer products are using, um, and when I say the newer products, you know, your gel products, your, your, your chews, um, they're using a carbohydrate called maltodextrin. So initially, you know, when the, the first sports drinks came out, they were using simple sugars, sucrose, fructose, dec dextrose, excuse me. And, uh, and then, in the 90s, maltodextrin came on the market, and, and maltodextrin is a more complex carbohydrate than simple sugar. So the theory behind it was that it would be easier on the stomach. If, if a carbohydrate has a more complex structure, then in theory, it's going to digest uh, more easily and, and get it through the stomach more easily. So it won't cause some of that GI distress. But from a blood sugar standpoint, maltodextrin is a very fast-acting carbohydrate. It's designed to give you that quick burst of energy and give you that that sugar spike. And for any of you folks that have utilized the gel product before, you, you felt that. You know that it's designed to be taken in and, and give you that quick burst of energy. If we look at the graph on the screen, though, the, the downside of that is 
you know, what comes up must, uh, what goes up must come down. And, and you see it with the blue line, you see the big spike caused by maltodextrin. This is a 25 gram serving, which is roughly what you'd find in a typical gel product. And then about 30 minutes later on the x-axis, you see that big sharp drop. And for most people, when the blood sugar starts to drop around that 30 or 40 minute mark, that's a signal that you need to take in more fuel. Now, ideally, uh, the way we would want a carbohydrate to act in terms of supporting that energy maintenance over a long period of time, like the marathon or the half marathon, is something that breaks down very slowly and steadily over time and is able to maintain that steady and even blood sugar level. And that's really what the red line is showing. That red line that shows super starch um, is really showing an ideal way that a carbohydrate will act, giving you that slow and steady release and keeping your blood sugar steady over an extended period of time. So what we see with this super starch, which is the key ingredient in Generation UCAN, which we'll, we'll talk about the origins here in a moment, but with the super starch, we see that same serving, a 25 gram serving, first of all, it doesn't spike you in that big way like the maltodextrin does, but more importantly, the decline is very slow and steady over time. So you're never gonna get that big crash. And, and if you look at this, uh, the x-axis, about 90 minutes to two hours later in terms of time, your blood sugar is still right around baseline, right around where it started. So the super starch is really able to give you that consistent and steady energy on an equivalent serving, uh, compared to an equivalent serving of maltodextrin, the super starch is able to last you, you know, about two to three times as long because it's breaking down slowly and steadily over time. But you know, and, and the, so like I mentioned, the super starch is really the key ingredient in UCAN products, and it comes both in powdered format and in bar format. Uh, Greg, before I get into the origins, I'm just curious, um, when did UCAN and, and super starch really come on your radar? And uh, we've kind of set the scene a little bit in terms of what super starch does and, and how it's different, but what intrigued you, um, you know, as a coach and an exercise physiologist about UCAN? Well, it really started for me as the runner, where in my first few marathons, I used the traditional strategy that you use for fueling, and it just wasn't successful. I wasn't able to have sustained energy. I was really susceptible to the crash after taking in more of the fast-acting, as you say, carbohydrates. And so I couldn't fuel enough to have enough energy because my gut got upset, and then I was really susceptible to these spikes and crashes and obviously as an exercise physiologist kind of knew what was going on I knew well I'm flooding my system with carbohydrate and so the body's saying well, we gotta lower that blood glucose and then I would have that spike or the crash later and so I was looking for something um, that could maintain more of a, a steady energy as you mentioned and also something I didn't have to take as frequently because I felt like that might make my stomach a little happier. And I heard about Generation UCAN, so I immediately got some product and began to try it to see, okay, can this not only give me the energy that I want, sort of this, instead of the spike and the crash, a little more steady feeling, but also would it be easier on my stomach? Because nobody likes those bathroom breaks or, or just feeling so bad in your stomach that you, you don't fuel and you don't hydrate, even though you know you should, you can't because your stomach's so messed up. So that's when I really started getting it. And, and like most things I do, practice on myself. Uh, see how does, how does it work for me? And, and I found it to be very successful and thus have used it ever since. So it's a great background, Greg. And, and you know, what's intriguing about UCAN um, and, and kind of what intrigued me about it and, and for a lot of other folks, in addition to the science, is kind of the story behind this super starch carbohydrate and what it was originally created for. So the slide on the screen shows our founder's son, Jonah, and Jonah suffers from a life-threatening blood sugar disease that basically causes uh, him to have life-threatening hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. So these kids with this condition, it's called glycogen storage disease, they're unable to break down carbohydrates and convert them into glucose to give them energy. So it's a catch-22. When they consume traditional carbohydrates, uh, they can't break them down, so that causes a host of issues. But if they don't consume carbohydrates, then they don't get glucose and they're unable to keep their blood sugar steady, their blood sugar drops, and that, that also creates a host of issues. So from the time that Jonah was born, um, his parents were actually feeding him uh, a small amount of cornstarch every 90 minutes to two hours. And they had to do this, uh, you know, 
eight to 10 times a day, three to four times in the middle of the night. And it was very, very critical that they didn't miss a feeding or Jonah could go into these hypoglycemic episodes. Um, and, you know, one of the things, uh, the reason they found that cornstarch worked for these kids is because it was metabolized a little bit differently. So it was able to to bypass some of the issues that, that they were facing. But the reality is because it was a very regimented uh, feeding schedule, you know, it was an extremely stressful life for his parents and for the families of other kids that have this condition. And it's a very rare condition, only affects about 5,000 kids in the country. So it wasn't, wasn't a lot of funding, wasn't a lot of research being done on uh, this condition. And so for Jonah's family, you know, there, there's actually a, a documentary on, on YouTube called Life by the Clock. They, they literally were living a life by the clock, having to set multiple alarm clocks, wake up in the middle of the night to make sure they didn't miss a feeding. Um, so they were very proactive. You know, he was born in, in 2000 and, and uh, right around then his family started a foundation and they knew that in their lifetime, there was not going to be a cure for this condition. So they were really looking at, at different types of nutrition therapies to at least alleviate the stress on their lives, alleviate the stress for Jonah and, and, you know, be able to provide him with something at least at night that would allow him to maintain that steady blood sugar level, steady energy level and sleep throughout the night. And Ultimately, this is where the super starch was discovered. So for eight years, uh, some of the top carbohydrate researchers in the world, um, in Scotland, they were looking at all different types of grains, different types of starches, uh, tapioca, barley, wheats. And eventually they found that starting with a non-GMO cornstarch and putting it through a very specific cooking process, just involving heat, water, and pressure over an extended period of time actually significantly changed the structure of the of the carbohydrate of the of the cornstarch and caused it to break down much more slowly and steadily over time. So a lot of people hear cornstarch and you know they, they say isn't isn't corn high glycemic? Doesn't it enter uh, your system very quickly? And so what's really key to understand is is that that's all absolutely true. But the way this non-GMO cornstarch is cooked actually changes all of that very significantly. It, it, it creates a much longer chain carbohydrate and it causes it to break down very slowly and steadily. So, uh, you know, starting in 2008, when the super starch became available, Jonah was able to take in a large amount of it prior to sleeping at night. And it actually broke down very slowly, trickled into the system very slowly. And was, he was able to maintain that steady blood sugar level for eight hours. Now he was taking in quite a large dose, about uh, 90 to hundred grams of this super starch at once, but taking all that in at once uh, really allowed him to maintain that steady blood sugar level. So he was able to sleep throughout the night. So this was a major, major discovery, uh, you know, for the family, really life changing uh, for his parents, for his family, being able to, to give this to him and keep his energy steady so he could sleep throughout the night. Uh, but, you know, we started wondering what else could this carbohydrate be used for? You know, what impact would it have on, on athletes? What impact would it have just on general folks? Um, without this condition, without this glycogen storage disease. Um, so we'll get to that in a moment, but I should just reiterate that uh, the, the cornstarch that it's used is non-GMO. Cooking process is completely natural, no chemicals, no enzymes. And we at UCAN, uh, we do have the worldwide patent on this cooking technology. So this is not something that, that just anybody can do. This is a very specific process that's applied to this non-GMO cornstarch. And it's really though the way it's cooked that makes it different than just going to the grocery store and buying regular cornstarch at the grocery store. And then finally, it, it is gluten free as well. So the super starch carbohydrate, it is uh, gluten free. So as we were starting to wonder, you know, because as Greg's talked about, and we've kind of identified, we all want to manage our glucose levels, whether it's for athletic performance, you know, even if we don't have this condition, whether it's for athletic performance, whether it's just to manage our energy throughout the day, um, you know, whether it's to prevent blood sugar swings that can lead to certain conditions like prediabetes or, or metabolic syndrome. If we can maintain that steady blood sugar level, it's going to be extremely beneficial for both health and athletic performance. Uh, and so as we were looking in 2008, 2009, um, you know, at other applications of the super starch carbohydrate, we started reaching out to various dietitians and nutritionists. And the feedback from all of them was, you know, very promising, at least on the theory behind this. Now, they all said you need to put some clinical research behind this, which we ultimately did. That was the blood sugar graph that we looked at a couple slides ago where we, where we tested our, our carbohydrate against maltodextrin in a, in a clinical trial at the University of Oklahoma. But theoretically, a lot of people were telling us this has a lot of promise. You know, this is very unique. Most of the sports nutrition products are designed to give you that 
quick burst of energy. This is coming at it from a different way. And, and one of the first athletes to, to utilize UCAN before we even had a product was Meb Kaflesky, who uh, at age 41 is about to run his fourth uh, or is about to uh, compete in the Olympics for the fourth time in his just incredible running career. Um, he'll be running on, on Sunday. And, and back in 2009, um, as he was training for the New York City Marathon, which he actually won that year, Meb started playing around with UCAN in his training. And at that time, his nutritionist, uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Krista Austin, had told us that as Meb was getting older, he too was struggling with a lot of the, the factors that Greg has identified in terms of fueling. You know, he was struggling with the, the GI issues from the simple carbohydrates um, in terms of mid-run fueling. So Meb's nutritionist, uh, Krista, you know, liked the idea that this was something, this UCAN with super starch in it was something that Meb could load up on prior to going out for a training run. And it would just keep the blood sugar level and the energy level very steady and very even over an extended period of time. And, and since then, you know, he's been implementing UCAN in, in a variety of ways into his training. Uh, he relies on it from a recovery standpoint. He relies on it to help keep him lean. But we won't get into too much of all of that, but just, um, you know, kind of wanted to illustrate that this is where it all started with, with you know, first with Jonah and then with Mev. And then finally in 2010 at the Boston Marathon, that's when we uh, launched our UCAN products and that's when they became commercially available. And, you know, just been remarkable uh, kind of the number of people that have taken to it since then, uh, both from the top athlete standpoints, the, the top coaches like Greg, uh, as well as, you know, a wide range of, of age groupers, Boston Marathon qualifiers, first time runners, runners, you know, both looking to, to improve their performance, but also looking to get lean. There, there's really been a lot of different applications and a lot of different ways that people have found to incorporate you can into their training, but we want to really stay focused uh, for the purpose of this webinar on the application of you can for marathon and half marathon training or, or for distance running. Um, so let's take a, a little bit of a few minutes to talk through the different you can products. Uh, we'll bring Greg back in here and, and talk specifically about how to implement this in your training and on race day. So there's essentially four different types of UCAN products. And I'm going to start with, you know, what we simply call the UCAN, which is our, our powdered drink mix that features the super starch carbohydrate, which is, again, the key ingredient in UCAN. That's the energy source. So we don't use sugars. There's no sugar in UCAN. It's all the energy, all the carbohydrate is coming from the super starch. Depending on the serving size, whether you're going to get it in bulk in a tub or whether you're going to get it as a single serve packet, the serving size ranges from 80 to 130 calories per serving. The way you really want to think about UCAN is not as a sports drink that you sip on slowly as you're running. It's, it's not a traditional sports drink in any way. This is really a pre-exercise snack. I tell people this is liquid food that you're drinking prior to your run. It's very easy on your stomach, so it doesn't sit heavy. And if you consume it prior to your run, then once you start exercising, it's just going to break down very slowly and steadily over time and maintain that steady and even blood sugar level. Um, generally speaking, people find that the packet, which is roughly that 130 calorie serving, lasts them about 90 minutes to two hours once they start exercising. Whereas a tub, which is uh, a scoop, excuse me, which is roughly that 80 calorie serving is good for about an hour once you start exercising. So one of the really unique things about UCAN is you know, like Greg mentioned, that what he likes about it uh, in part is that you don't have to fuel as frequently and you don't have to take in as much. And and that's really twofold. It's A, because the carbohydrate is much more of a slower and steady release. So you're not getting all the calories very quickly. You're getting them at a much more controlled rate. And number two is that when you don't spike your blood sugar, your body's better able to tap into and metabolize fat. So a big issue that happens with a lot of runners is they're so uh, sugar dependent that you're not really allowing your body to optimize its ability to burn fat, which is, you know, a key to having success in the marathon. So, you know, when you're taking in that banana or that bagel or that, that energy gel and you're spiking your blood sugar right before you go out there and exercise, your body's really saying, I have all this sugar in my blood. Let me burn that sugar first before I burn fat. And then, you know, throughout the duration of your exercise, if you're constantly putting your body through those blood sugar swings and you're, you're sucking in, uh, sucking down a gel every 30 minutes, again, you're not letting your body reach that optimal fat burning state. And, and this is something that, you know, 
there's certain workouts in terms of, you know, that steady state long run that can improve your body's ability to burn fat. But from a nutritional standpoint, you know, what you do in terms of fueling during training is also significantly going to impact your body's ability to burn fat. So if in training, you're somebody that's pounding the sugars and, and really relying on a lot of these quick energy sources, then you're not going to allow your body in that training period to improve your fat burning ability. That's where we really, really view you can as an extremely valuable training tool that both allows you to maintain steady energy levels by providing you with that steady release of carbohydrate, but it's doing that without negatively impacting your ability to burn fat. So the You Can Drink Mix, it comes in a variety of flavors. It's a, it's a little bit starchy undoubtedly in texture, so we do recommend uh, mixing it up with cold water, giving it a good hard shake if you have a shaker bottle or even popping it in the blender at home if that's convenient. Um, but it isn't something that's going to dissolve in water. You do want to give it a good hard shake and you want to consume it about 30 minutes prior to your run. Now, this same product uh, can also be consumed during your run. And, and we'll have another slide in a, in a couple minutes here that'll, that'll really walk you through the exact protocol that we recommend, both uh, whether it's in training or um, you know whether it's uh, on race day. But uh, the same you can drink mix can be used both pre-run as well as during your run. Then we've got the you can with protein. So this again is the same premise. It's got the super starch in it that's going to keep your blood sugar and your energy steady. Um, and then it's got added protein as well to allow your body to repair and rebuild your muscle. So this is something that a lot of people uh, and Meb specifically uses this after almost every hard workout from a recovery standpoint. And, and what we see being the benefit of the you can with protein and, and having the, the super starch as your post-workout carbohydrate is that it's going to allow you to maintain that steady blood sugar and steady energy level post-workout. So a lot of times, you know, you get done with a long run and you might not have the luxury of sitting down for a, a well-balanced meal right away. Getting this, the carbohydrate in the form of super starch after a run is really going to keep the blood sugar and energy level steady so you don't experience that post-workout crash. Uh, Greg, I know this is something that, that you've really relied on um, in a big way. Uh, throughout a variety of your training. Can you just speak to kind of um, your rationale behind using the you can with protein um, as your recovery shake? Yeah, there's been some research. In fact, it, it occurred a while back that was showing if you ingest some carbohydrates with a little protein within the first 30 minutes after f finishing a hard workout or long workout, uh, the enzyme that's uh, restores or replenishes those carbohydrate stores that you've burned is ramped up 300 percent. So you take advantage of that by putting uh, you know something in your body quickly but a lot of times you don't want to eat a meal right after so I think having a shake or something is really good because you get you take advantage of that what they call the glycogen window uh, and then it also satiates you just enough that when you get home you're typically not going to you know, ravage the pantry for all the stuff you shouldn't be eating. You take your time, you prepare a more proper meal. So I find my, my actually nutrition is so much better just because I'm not so hungry after runs uh, when I get home. So taking that, I think, right after is, is really beneficial for those two kind of things. And you're going to hear, you know, you've probably heard me already say it time and time again, but a lot of what Greg's talking about really comes back to that ability to stabilize blood sugar. So where this is different than a lot of your carb protein drinks, whether it's, you know, something like chocolate milk that might have 20 or 25 grams of sugar, or even a, you know, a carb protein drink with 20 grams of maltodextrin is that the super starch is really what's contributing to helping you curb that post-workout hunger because it's keeping your blood sugar level steady. You know, a lot of times um, people, uh, we've heard this time and time again, where, you, you know, you pound that chocolate milk after a workout and then 45 minutes later, you're starving because your body's gone through that sugar spike. Um, there's actually some interesting research um, that for women specifically that consuming a high glycemic carbohydrate immediately in the post-workout window can have um, extreme negative impacts in terms of your ability to continue burning fat in the post-workout period. So for those that are focused on body composition and training, uh, another big benefit of this you can with protein, and this is something that Meb's seen um, you know, to a great degree as he's gotten older is that by keeping your blood sugar steady and keeping that hormone insulin low, that insulin is a hormone that every time you get a sugar spike, your body will produce insulin, but it's, it's a storage hormone and it's basically helping you get that excess sugar out of your bloodstream and, and it's storing it away as fat. So 
you're able to better burn fat when your insulin's low and, and the super starch by releasing slowly and steadily and not spiking your sugars, it doesn't cause an insulin response. So it's allowing your body in that post-workout period to continue burning fat. But this product is something that can also be used pre-run as well. So because it has the super starch in it, we find that some folks, um, you know, if they're going out for a long run and don't want to eat much breakfast, um, people have had success having the you can with protein 30 to 60 minutes prior to a run as well and, and really using that as a uh, breakfast or a pre-exercise snack and a, that having a little bit of protein in there will help curb some of that hunger that you might feel, um, you know, 35, uh, 45 minutes or an hour into your run. Um, and then we've got the you can snack bar. So these are also another product with the super starch in it, um, you know, conceptually similar to the powders just in bar form. Uh, they've also got some added protein, fiber, and fat that'll curb hunger. Um, they're, they're very low in sugar uh, compared to a lot of the other energy bars on the market. So five to six grams of sugar per bar, which is, you know, a fraction of what you'll see in uh, your common uh, mainstream uh, energy bars that people typically have. And again, the key here is the super starch. That's the primary carbohydrate source in this bar. And that's what's keeping your blood sugar and energy steady. So this is something that you can also use, you know, pre-workout, um, pre-run as, as a substitute to the powders. Uh, we generally find that the bars are, are going to last folks about 60, uh, 60 to 75 minutes uh, in terms of keeping your energy steady for that period of time. Now, it does have some protein in it, about 46 grams, depending on the flavor. Um, so you can use it post-workout to, to curb some of that post-workout hunger and, again, keep your blood sugar levels steady. But we would put this more in uh, energy bar, a steady energy bar category than we do a protein bar. This is not a 20 gram protein muscle building meal replacement bar, but it is a great snack option, either pre-workout or post-workout. Then the final uh, product we'll talk about, and then we'll uh, drill down on um, just some specifics on how to use this in your training, um, is the UCAN Hydrate. So the UCAN drink mixes all do contain electrolytes, both sodium and potassium, similar quantities to what you'd find in a typical gel product. But the UCAN Hydrate, um, this is our only product without the super starch in it. So this is a, a zero calorie electrolyte replacement with no sugar. It's got a higher concentration of sodium and potassium, and it also has a good amount of magnesium, 50 milligrams per serving. And, and magnesium it is actually uh, an electrolyte that a lot of uh, folks are deficient in, especially athletes. So we have double the magnesium in this product compared to a lot of um, electrolyte products out there on the market. So this is something that, again, this is not going to give you energy. This is for hydration. This is to prevent cramping. Uh, this is something that you can sip on in between your doses of the UCAN fuel. And, and with the UCAN Hydrate product, you know, depending on your own sweat level, uh, depending on where you're training or racing and, and you know, the, the weather conditions and the heat and all of that, um, you know, this is something that some folks find necessary to supplement with the UCAN fuel uh, or others find that the electrolytes in the UCAN drink mixes with the superstars, they find that the electrolytes in those products are sufficient for them. So with all of this, you know, you just want to play around with it in your training and and see what works best for you. So, uh, Greg, yeah, you, you, I'll bring you back in here. Um, let's talk personally for you as we look at the before and the during application of UCAN. What for you um, has personally worked well, and what are you hearing from your runners that has worked well in terms of fueling with UCAN for these marathon type workouts or races? I think what the big paradigm shift, and you mentioned it before, is that. You can is not a sports drink like a traditional sports drink. So you're not supposed to take it every 15 to 20 minutes like you would normal, you know, a normal sports drink. It's really more like a food. And so what people are finding, this is certainly what I find, is that one serving every hour uh, really works well for marathon type long runs and certainly the race itself. And that's so nice because what it means is that you only have to add in the carbohydrate once every hour. And then anything you do in between is just really hydration and electrolytes. So you're not really slamming a lot of fast acting sugars into your body every 15 minutes or so with a sports drink or 30 to 45 minutes with a gel. So for myself, I like one serving every hour. Uh, a little bit before, so you have 30 minutes before, have a serving, and then at the one hour mark, the two hour mark, even three hour mark, if I were going longer, uh, really 
Well, it keeps my stomach happy and keeps my energy level steady, and that's been kind of consistent across the board. Again, everybody's a little bit unique, so you have to play around, but that's a good starting point is take a serving 30, 45 minutes before you start a workout, and then once every hour uh, along the way is a great way to do it. And Greg, I often tend to do do this, you know, sometimes bury uh, the most, uh, kind of what a lot of runners find to be the most significant thing about you can, but what you just mentioned in terms of keeping your stomach happy, I mean, that's that, like Greg told us, you know, for a lot of runners, that's the biggest thing that can sabotage, you know, months of great training and, and can sabotage a, a race and can be very frustrating. And so that's really one of the biggest things we're hearing about you can because of uh you know it's twofold because you're not taking in as much and fueling as frequently there's simply less going into your stomach that could potentially bother it but the other uh point kind of from a structural standpoint is the super starch it's an extremely long chain carbohydrate it's a very very complex molecule and and essentially what that means is it's going to bypass and get out of your stomach very, very quickly. So the, the best way I can describe it is, you know, a few minutes after you drink it, um, while the texture is a little bit thicker, you're just not really going to even feel it in your stomach. It almost disappears. So that's really what runners have gravitated to you can for, you know, it, it gives you that energy, but it still allows you to feel light. And, and that's, a, that's a huge, huge point that Greg raised. Um, we had a question from Peter that Greg just really touched on, but, uh, you know, Peter, you asked, why is it recommended to drink you can all at once, um, versus sipping it. And, and Greg, I know actually initially before, you know, we, we were really working together and, and you were still, um, you know, experimenting and using you can, you were actually kind of sipping it at first, right? That that's what you'd done when you ran the Boston marathon with you can a few years ago. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't you initially sipping it? And more recently you've kind of changed the way you've been using it. Yeah, I started with with kind of using it in the traditional way, uh, like a sports drink, uh, and that was okay. But I actually found it's a little bit better um, to spread out the feedings. Uh, certainly more convenient to do that. It's a simpler nutrition strategy. Uh, but to mix a packet in eight ounces of water or something like that, and take that every hour is very very doable. I found that. That strategy with then the in-between where I would be just having water and electrolytes seemed to, to work the best for me. Again, everybody has to experiment, but I'm just going for the least complicated nutrition strategy. And that to me is once every hour and then water and electrolytes in between. And what we're finding with our athletes is there is some variation, but that's a great place to start uh, out and then you can begin to adjust from there. And in terms of the variation Greg speaks of, um, you know, and, and actually just take one step back. So, you know, one of the other things that Greg said in terms of sipping versus having it all at once, if you think about you can as a food rather than a sports drink, then that'll really, you know, maybe lend some clarity around why you kind of want to consume it over a relatively short period of time. We're not saying you have to chug it in 10 seconds. You know, a lot of people are drinking a serving every hour, say over the course of a mile or over the course of, you know, five minutes. So, um, you know, you have a little bit of leeway there, but it's really, you know, the way the carbohydrate works because it's not a sugar that's giving you that quick burst of energy. Kind of the, the theory behind sipping on a sugar-based drink is that, you know, by constantly sipping on it, you're keeping the blood sugar level steady because you're getting that, you know, kind of that constant burst, that constant burst. But it requires you to be drinking and, and, you know, consuming that throughout the entire time. And if you get behind, um, it can be trouble. So with you can, you know, because of the way it breaks down slowly, where people really do have the most success um, is consuming a serving, you know, over a relatively short period of time and then spacing it out um, in the appropriate intervals, you know, an hour if it's if it's a scoop. Um, and, and that's the, the versatile thing about you can, as you see on this chart, you know, if you're somebody that tolerates taking in more at once well, then we have people, you know, doing the same type of thing that we're talking about here, but rather than that, that scoop size serving, which is, you know, that roughly 80 calorie serving every hour, we have others that are taking a little bit larger of a serving and taking that packet, you know, which is about that 130 calorie serving. And they're doing that every 90 minutes, you know, that there's other folks that are going to take in two scoops at once. So they'll take in two scoops before they start. And then every two hours, they'll take in another two scoops. And what we've really seen is that 
this same protocol, whether you're running a four hour marathon or a six hour marathon, you know, that scoop an hour or that packet every 90 minutes, uh, seems to at a general level work for people regardless of the time that they're out there. And, and of course, the importance of practicing this in training is to figure out and to dial in exactly how much you need to take and at what intervals you should space it out. You know, you can absolutely adjust this up and down, up or down. So you could do, you know, if you were somebody that just felt like you needed it, or, or if you're a very high carbohydrate burner, um, at, at least initially starting out, you might want to do a scoop every 45 minutes. Similarly, if you've trained your body to be very efficient at burning fat, you might say, hey, for me, a scoop lasts 90 minutes. So there's a little bit of playing around with this in training. Now, Jim asks a question, which I know is probably on many people's mind. He says, how many fluid ounces are in one serving to go along with one serving at a time? And I actually want to skip to this slide. Uh, that's one of the beauties of UCAN. So the amount of fluid you mix a serving with has no bearing on how the product works or how the product digests. So this, again, is a little bit of a paradigm shift. You know, a lot of runners with these sugar-based products, you're used to having to mix it if it's a powder with a certain amount of fluid to, because of the way it impacts digestion. Or if you're uh, you know, consuming a gel, you, you kind of know that I'm supposed to chase it with this amount of water to help it digest. But with the super starch, it's going to digest the same whether it's mixed with you know, 16 ounces of fluid or two ounces of fluid. So you really want to think of the amount of UCAN you're taking really in terms of the amount of the powder, not in terms of the amount of fluid. A lot of people that are consuming UCAN during their training or during a race, they're actually mixing it up very thick and almost making their own gel, mixing up a serving with two to three ounces of water, you know, as you can see here in this image, giving it a good, good stir with a, a fork and then either carrying it in some type of soft flask or, or maybe a fuel belt bottle or, you know, even getting creative and putting it in a Ziploc baggie so you can just bite the corner off and squeeze it into your mouth like a gel. So that's one of the nice things about UCAN. When we're talking about a serving every hour, we're not telling you you have to drink 12 ounces of water every hour. You know, you can really get that UCAN to be as thick as you can tolerate it in terms of consistency. And then in between your servings of UCAN, that's where you can worry about your hydration and sip on your fluids. Um, and then just in terms of uh, those getting started with UCAN, you know, one of the big things is that, again, this is a, a different type of carbohydrate. And this is something where, you know, the fueling guidelines and the fueling protocols for UCAN, they're still evolving, right? This hasn't been around for years and years and years where, uh, you know, where there's like these well-defined, um, you know, extremely established fueling protocols. But what I do caution uh, you from, from doing is really don't try to apply traditional carbohydrate recommendations to UCAN because it's a different type of carbohydrate. It works differently. It breaks down differently. So uh, the chart on the uh, screen kind of illustrates this. You know, for a lot of people, say for a 90-minute long run, they're having 130 calorie serving of UCAN prior to their run and then just sipping on water, not needing to take in additional fuel during that run. You know, similarly, if you were going with the traditional fueling protocol, you know, you might have some type of energy bar uh, and then sip on a sports drink, which would get you up to about 300 calories uh, pre and during that run. Or if you're following the traditional gel recommendations, you might do a gel before, then a gel every 30 minutes, three gels, 300 calories during that run. So that's the thing with UCAN, you know, we're able to consume less of it because as I, I read from the quote at the bottom of this slide from Dr. Kathy Eckel, she's a, a metabolic researcher at Yale University, she says it's really the ability to maintain blood sugar that sustains energy levels. So from a fitness standpoint, UCAN is huge because it does that without, of putting, without putting lots of calories on board. It's really beneficial because you can make every calorie count. So I think I said this uh, a little bit earlier, but to reiterate, you know, with this super starch, it's both releasing very slowly and because of the way it releases, it's allowing you to metabolize and utilize more of your stored body fat for fuel. And, and we all have exponentially more stored fat than we do stored carbohydrate. We can only store a finite amount of carbohydrate. Uh, even somebody like Meb, who's very, very lean, has, you know, tens of thousands, uh, 10,000 uh, calories of stored fat in terms of body fat that he can access and utilize for fuel. So you can is really encouraging you by the way the carbohydrate releases to be able to use a better mix of fuels, uh, which is why, you know, it's not that you're depriving yourself or, or taking in less just for the sake of taking in less. You just simply don't need to take in as much 
to maintain those steady energy levels. Uh, Greg, is that lived up to what you've experienced with UCAN in terms of when you've been doing these longer runs? Do you find that you're able to get by with less than what you were perhaps doing previously? Yes, I think that that, and again, that's another paradigm shift because so much of the fueling recommendation has been on a number of calories per hour. But I think you make a very good point that when you have a different type of carbohydrate, then that it really, those numbers don't work anymore. And so ultimately, I think it just comes down to the scoop, <laughs> the scoop or the pouch. Whatever you need, uh, one per hour seems to work for most people, and that'll be significantly less calories. But I think that those calories you're taking in, those 300 calories, they're not all being used to fuel your performance. So it's it's not it doesn't work exactly that way. So you, you you shouldn't just follow those recommendations with this product. Again, I think it's its own thing and uh, I have not experienced any reduced amount of energy by using UCAN. Conversely, I've actually felt better doing it and felt like I had more steady energy the whole time. So um, I don't think you can use that traditional model of X number of calories per hour is required. And you know, I, I, it's like it's like you did it when you first got your hand on the product. You just said, "Let me, let me, to go out there, do some training runs, and and put it to the test." And that's kind of what we encourage folks to do to figure out how to best space out uh, the doses. Um, I'll just add a, one or two more points before we wrap this up. We have a, a few people asking, kind of just about logistically mixing it up and carrying it on on the race course. So. You can absolutely mix this up, you know, up to 48 hours in advance. So I don't recommend trying to, you know, play around with this while you're running and mix it up on course. The, the powder's fluffy. It's, you know, it's going to get kind of get all over you. You're not going to be very happy. So definitely, you know, pre-mix it, pre-prepare it the night before, and then, um, you know, transfer it into your, your bottles, whether it's a fuel belt or a gel flask or, or a water bottle. And, you know, many people, if you don't want to carry multiple bottles, um, and, and you're, you're running with a handheld, uh, but when we talked about mixing it up thicker, you can concentrate several servings, you know, so you can get many hours of nutrition in just one bottle. And then if you run by the aid stations and, and you, you know, you can just worry about grabbing water and, you know, in terms of carrying it with you, I know uh, we have a few people saying, what if you're not an elite, you know, how do you carry this with you? Do you have to have someone hand it with you, uh, hand it to you? Greg, you kind of recommend um, almost th that all of your runners carry their own fuel and, and hydration, don't you? Absolutely. There's there's so many great uh, hydration packs these days that you can always find one that works perfectly for you. And I think it just, again, it reduces the issues during races. I mean, if you run big races, the water stops are like, it's like a traffic jam and you're so worried about trying to get in and you splash half of it all over you. I say just carry it. You can mix it up ahead of time. You can drink exactly what you want to drink on your schedule. And there's so many great packs now that you can easily have on board exactly what you need. And um, I just think it makes everything easier. And easier means that you can focus more on pushing when you get tired. So that's kind of the uh, pre and during aspect of UCAN. We'll just run through this quickly. Afterwards, we already talked about why Greg likes the UCAN with protein after exercise. So that that uh, can absolutely be used from a recovery standpoint, also to to just keep your blood sugar and energy steady, so you don't have that post workout crash. Same deal with the UCAN snack bars. Again, because of it, it's not a, a very high amount of protein. You know, think of this more as something to curb hunger and keep your energy steady, and then you can get an additional protein, you know, when you sit down to have your meal in terms of, uh, in terms of real food. Um, and then the, you can hydrate the electrolyte product can certainly drink that after exercise to, to rehydrate without sugar. I mean, then the everyday use application, you know, we, we won't talk too much about this, this is probably, a actually did a great webinar with Greg and, and Kathy Echo, who I alluded to, um, back in January, kind of talking about, um, you know, nutrition and, and the application of, of you can kind of outside of the, the training period uh, from a weight loss standpoint. But this is, again, something because it doesn't have the sugars in it, this is not just a marathon training product. This is something that especially the UCAN with protein or the UCAN bars that people are, are implementing as part of, of meal replacement shakes, blending it with healthy fats and other protein, um, you know, to create a more complete meal replacement shake. And, and the UCAN really contributes, again, by keeping your blood sugar and keeping your energy steady, which can help you 
Curb Hunger and, and Greg, without taking too much longer, I know uh, you've had some success. Just maybe you can speak to that briefly with the You Can With Protein from a weight loss standpoint, haven't you? Yeah, I wanted to uh, get a little bit leaner last fall as I was getting ready for a race series and was able to use it as a meal replacement. It was my lunch meal replacement uh, and it satiated you know, my hunger, but I was getting fewer calories in and I was able to lose the weight that I wanted to lose without sort of starving myself or being grumpy around my family. And so I think it's a really great meal replacement uh, as well that, uh, you know, you get, it just satiates you and keeps your blood sugar steady so you're not hungry and kind of buys you time in between meals. I know Meb does that a lot too. That's a big part of his use of you can is to stay lean by uh, making sure he's not um, not over consuming. Absolutely, and you know, especially when he's traveling, kind of outside of the training window, when he's traveling and doing a lot of appearances, he'll very often rely on that you can with protein shake in the afternoon just to tide him over until his next meal. And we've seen a lot of people using it that way. So you know, really in summary. Super starch is what's unique about you can. It's a different type of carbohydrate. Um, you can has different fueling protocols and, and certainly, um, you know, you guys have an opportunity to, to reach out to me after this webinar and, uh, and I'm happy to, to talk you through it, um, as well. And, and I'll be sending this out as a recording so everyone can review. And, and just one final point I want to make is that, you know, you can and super starch is still a carbohydrate. So when we're talking about burning fat, you know, this is not, we're not talking about a ketogenic diet or anything like that. I mean, you are still getting carbohydrate from UCAN. We're just providing you with carbohydrate at a more optimal rate where your body can better utilize fat. So that's, that's a big thing that I just want to make sure I, I saw one question from uh, somebody asking about, you know, ketoacidosis with UCAN, but, but, you know, that's really not, not a concern. This is providing you with glucose and carbohydrate at a very steady rate. And it's allowing your body to also utilize fat and do what it wants to do during exercise, which is burn fat. Um, so, Greg, this is, uh, you know, we've, we've covered a lot. We've, we've gone a long way. I know a lot of folks will probably use this as a reference point as they're training for their fall marathon um, to, to look back on a lot of the wisdom that you shared with us in the beginning. And for those interested in you can, um, you know, the second half of this webinar will hopefully provide you with a pretty comprehensive look at how to use the product in training. Um, but Greg, if people want to get more involved with you, uh, take advantage of, you know, some of the education, your run club, uh, how can folks interact more with Macmillan Running and, uh, and kind of get more on board with your training philosophies? Well, it's pretty easy. Just go to the website, macmillanrunning.com. We've got our whole list of training and coaching services there uh, that you can take advantage of. There's obviously a contact page, so if you want to send an email, um, have asked specific questions feel free to do that we've got a variety of different services we can build you a training plan we offer personal coaching we've got online training community we've got lots of different things so I welcome you to ask questions of me and uh, if I can help you in any way just let me know awesome Greg and uh, I will be sending out a link to uh, the Macmillan running uh, website and also how to get involved with the Macmillan Run Club specifically, which you see on the screen. But um, as you can see, a lot of great options um, at MacmillanRunning.com. And Greg is, uh, you know, has tons and tons of experience coaching all different types of athletes. So um, a lot of things that you can uh, do uh, with Greg to help you improve your own running. But with that, Greg, I just want to thank you again for your time. It's always, uh, always fun doing this with you. Always fun um, hearing your insight. And I think uh, based on the comments I'm seeing, a lot of people found this to be extremely valuable. So thank you so much, Greg, for the time. Really appreciate the knowledge. Um, and for everybody who signed up and joined us, we really appreciate your interest. I know that, you know, for a lot of you, it's kind of getting into the heart of, or, or maybe just the beginning, depending on what race you're training for, or kind of the meat of your marathon training program. So hopefully we were able to give you some helpful information, both from the training and from the nutrition side of things. Uh, stay tuned in the next hour or two, you will be receiving a full copy of this by email with some additional information and a couple special offers. Um, but until then, we just appreciate everyone's time. And thanks again, Greg. Appreciate your time as well. Yep. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.